my name is Andy Bauer. I work at Kitware, and um, we are a, one of the you know, main developers of uh, Pairview, which is one of the packages which was shown earlier. So uh, just first, um, people may not know Kitware, so I figured I'd just um, put a little bit of information out there. Uh, we're about uh, started in 1998. Um, decent sized company, I don't know, depending on how you measure. Uh, we're growing regularly as people want our products more and more. Uh, we work for our, you know, with a variety of uh, people. It's really collaborative work that we're doing, uh, meaning that you know, folks want us to develop stuff using our essentially open source tools and a lot of uh, customizations, extensions, things like that. As I said, uh, we're basically more or less an open source development company. And uh, sometimes, especially when I started working there, I was like, well, am I going to have a job in five years? Because we're just giving our software away for free, right? So you know, it would be nice to be still working here. And, you know, and there's a lot of questions on, well, how do you actually make you know, money as a company stay in business doing open source? And basically, it's growing these open source solutions. We're working with customers, with collaborators to extend things. Um, the nice thing that we're trying to sell is basically improvements in the software as opposed to um, buying our software itself. You can buy the, you can actually just, it's a BSD, so you can actually sell it you, if you want to, if you can find someone stupid enough to buy it, as Ken Moreland from Sandia says. So and the idea is that, um, you know, we want to support science, we want to support these uh, kind of noble goals, which I think a lot of people here agree with. It's interesting work, but, you know, we're trying to better society in general, and open source is a way to do that. Open source, open tools, open formats. Um, and there's a variety of tools which are there that Kitware is involved with. Uh, so getting into ending with the Kitware spiel, um, I'll get into the content. So basically, it's similar to what Cyrus did for, um, for Visit. You're going to go through just some history of it, et cetera, get you going with hopefully with a little bit of an example here and there. Um, so what is Paraview? Well, Joe. Joe hit that fairly well, but uh, I'll say it again. It's an open source application BSD um, style license uh, in it. Uh, application, you know, we can extend it, do a whole bunch of stuff with it on your own since you have access to the source code. We certainly are, would appreciate any additions. If you think you want to change, want to improve, want to add something to pair of you, we're more than open um, to having you do that. Uh, it doesn't necessarily, you know, we have a variety of collaborators, just people which randomly are using the tool and say, hey, this is something neat which I think people might appreciate. And, you know, and they add it through our, you know, code review and testing procedures and it gets into Paraview. Uh, as far as why it's called Paraview, the para is supposed to be parallel. You know, we, similar to Visit, the idea is that we want to make sure that people are able to view, analyze, manipulate their large data sets which they're dealing with. So history, uh, uh, again, we started off of VTK, um, pair view that is, and the idea of building on a GUI so people could conveniently use a, the, you know, this visualization tool, the visualization toolkit, trying to make sure that, um, you know, that you don't have to be a programmer in, in order to actually access some of these tools and use them easily. Uh, and it's continuing to evolve. Um, you know, we're, uh, our latest release is about two or three weeks old. It's from Paraview version 5.1.2. Uh, it's going to be uh, put on Cooley. It's actually already on Cooley. We're just working out a couple of bugs for people that want to try it out. But the, um, the standard version, the well-tested version um, for people that want to do a connection to Cooley and try Paraview with a client server um, operation is uh, 4.3.1. So user interface that looks uh, slightly different than Visit. Uh, we have, uh, by default, all of our stuff is in one GUI window. Um, you know, when you're talking about, uh, you know, why you should use one or the other, maybe you know, maybe you understand, maybe you like our concepts of how things are laid out versus Visit. You know, the functionality is very similar between the two. They're both, uh, you know, which one is better? Again, as I said earlier, is a is more of a um, opinion than, than a fact for a lot of these things. And the, and the facts, you know, the places where one may beat the other as a, you know, factual, as a quantitative thing, that's going to change over time as well. Uh, anyway, so the menu bar is the top. It's kind of filing um, your typical file um, 
operations. The toolbars are quick shortcuts to do things which you're going to commonly do in Paraview, such that you can click on it very quickly and get access to it. The pipeline browser is, and I'll get into more details on all these um, later on, but the pipeline browser is essentially showing you a condensed version of what's actually what, what you're actually doing during your analysis and visualization. There's actually a lot of information stored in there, and I'll refer to that later on. The object inspector is basically ways to manipulate what you're having Paraview do, as well as getting some information out of Paraview as far as uh, what's, what kind of information your data sets have. And finally, view or views. We can have multiple views as well. Um, it's your big 3D win right now, just the 3D view on the right. So some, ver some lexicon, you know, trying to get you into the jargon. I'll say stuff and, you know, this is a VTK slash pair view jargon, which, you know, visit has its own jargon in similar ways. So something for us, we call a filter. I think um, visit would call that an operator a lot of times. Um, and so basically a filter is just a general way of um, taking in some, some pieces of information and possibly a data set, usually a data set, operating on it in some way and then outputting a result. So something like a slice filter, which you saw before, we take in a full volumetric data set, we put a slice through it, and out comes a 2D slice of, you know, through that domain. So that would be a filter. Some sub-objects of this are the reader. So a reader basically you know, reads information from a file and uh, makes it available for processing inside a pair of you. A source would be something along the lines of it doesn't have any inputs as far as it doesn't take data sets in, but it's useful for uh, doing certain operations. So if you want to see something like a cylinder, a source would be a cylinder where you say, okay, I want a cylinder with this radius, this discretization, and you know you do that in the source, you operate this source, and out comes this cil the cylinder in that example. View is just you know 3D, 2D, spreadsheet, plot views. That's our general way of saying visual stuff, which you're understanding your data. Uh, property. So property is, um, uh, again, one of these kind of computer science terms, which are uh, uh, tough to uh, be specific about. But the idea is property, in our case, when we're saying a property, is something like, well, when we're reading in a file, what's a file name? Well, that's a property of the reader, saying that the reader needs to know what file name to use in order to do that. Um, something like a gradient filter. Well, which, which uh, a property in this case would be which array do we want to operate on? And so that would be the property of the um, gradient filter. Slices, you know, normals, um, things like that. And views also have properties. Where do we place the angle? You know, our, our camera, how do we look at it? Things like that. So properties is just kind of a generic way of saying these are things which the user can set and manipulate to do certain things in pair view. And then client server operator, you know, client server again, similar to visit. And we call the built-in server, meaning that you have, you're just the GUI is using the actual same process itself as the server, as opposed to two separate processes doing those things. A remote server, possibly on a Cooley or different mach computing machine or even on your own machine. The remote server just meaning that it's a separate process from the client that you've connected to. So uh, first thing we'll get into, well, I'm sure, you know, these, these tools are fairly complex. You know, they have a lot of functionality in it and uh, trying to, you know, an hour just isn't enough to explain for any of these tools how to properly, you know, take advantage of everything in there. So I want to just lay out some help information there. So we have a pair of you user's guide. Um, you know, I think that's a couple hundred pages, freely available. Um, uh, the main pair of you uh, website is on the bottom along for documentation. We have ma mailing lists. I very strongly recommend the Pairview mailing list. It's just Pairview at Pairview.org. There's a lot of help. We typically get 20 to 30 emails a day on there and, answer, and generally they get answered you know, within a day or so, if not hours or so. Um, beyond that, you know, there's help in the GUI. The question mark and will help guide you for specific information on uh, filters, th different things in the pair view GUI that you'd like to get information on. There's also mouse hover, so if you just hover your mouse over one of the pair view GUI elements, there should be a pop-up window showing what's exactly there and give you a little bit more information on that as well. So how do you use pair view? So right, the, this is your typical workflow. You read in a file. Um, you have a file, you read it in, 
you have a slice operator in this case slicing through the domain then we want to do something like a warp essentially give some um, uh, changing the um, geometry of that to show certain patterns in the fields which we have and then finally show that in a display so the first thing you'll do is read in a file and we'll hit apply the idea here is, you know we have a lot of file formats pretty much I'd say the um, a Venn diagram of the pair view supported file formats and visit file formats are pretty much almost identical. There's, you know, maybe a small one here and there which one supports, which the other one doesn't. But again, you can add in plugins for both of those. You can add in Python um, importer to read in files into pair view, and I'm pretty sure that's available for visit as well. Um, so that's how you get your data into pair view. Gen generally, there's for most simulation codes that should. Uh, there's some way to get it in, in any case. So that, the next step then is to add in a filter. Say, okay, well, I want to do something. I want to look at in my look at my data in some specific way to get some insight into what's going on in it. Hit apply again, and something happens, and you get the operation which gets executed. You can then tune your display, set it out to what you want to look at. Finally, save data sets. You know, save images, stuff which you want to share with others, which you know has more compact, much more uh, useful information than the original data set. So again, a whole bunch of files are supported, and it's growing, you know, all the time. Uh, so uh, this is the same for visit. A lot of times, people open ParaView, they read in a file and say, "Hey, my screen is blank. What's going on? You know, it doesn't make sense." And again, this is well, when you're doing HPC computing, you know, it may re it may take you know a couple of you know 30 seconds to a minute. You know, in Joe's example earlier, uh, when he tried reading in a partition, you know, an unpartitioned, uh, unstructured grid, it took 15 minutes. So you can imagine if every time you wanted to tweak one thing, it would take 15 minutes, and you had to tweak it. The idea here is that you can tweak exactly what you want, and when you're ready to, t you know, to have that actual operation perform, you hit apply, telling the GUI and the server to say, okay, go ahead and do this. I'm ready now for you to do it. I have it exactly the way I want, as opposed to waiting for the machine to keep iterating on these small little things. Uh, for users, what you're start just starting out with ParaView, we have what's called the auto apply. Um, button or t you can toggle this auto apply so basically it'll just automatically hit the apply button for you every time you change something. For small data sets, you know, a couple hundred megabytes or so, it's a very convenient way because you know, you know, it saves a little bit, one less click a lot of times when you're doing things and things happen a little bit faster but you know, it's something which you probably want to turn off and which I do turn off when I'm doing, dealing with big data sets. So again, the pair of you data set types, uh, since we're both based on VTK, it's essentially the same things that Cyrus showed earlier. I'll just go into a little bit more details. Um, the reason we have these different data sets is that, well, we need to handle all of them efficiently, and certainly uh, if we're trying to store an you know, an, a Cartesian grid, essentially a VTK image data, if we're trying to store that as an unstructured grid, we're going to be wasting a whole lot of memory just storing stuff, you know, grid topology, which we already implicitly know. So the idea is we have, in VTK, we have these different um, grid types in there such that you have a very efficient representation of your grid based on, um, you know, how you, essentially what you need for your situation. So the first hands-on example, for those that have um, installed ParaView on their machine, uh, if you have 531, or well, actually this, this example works for pretty much all of them, you know, back to, I don't know, way before 3.11, way before I started working at Kitware, which is probably about eight years ago. Anyways, the first example here is that we want to create a cylinder source. So this is creating an arbitrary geometry coming from inside ParaView, so we're not even reading in a file or anything. And so the first step, we click on sources in the top level, in the top, uh, in the top menu level. And so we click on the um, sources in the menu bar, and it'll open up, it'll come down a menu, and you'll see a cylinder option there. So we'll go through, if you want, and you have pair of you running, click on the sources menu, and then click on cylinder. And similarly, if you don't click apply, nothing will be shown in the GUI. Uh, you can play around with some of the parameters in there if you'd like to, something like, you know, the the, uh, the radius of it, the where how it's located, it's um, discretization, so to speak, and then finally hit apply when you're happy. 
So now that you have that, um, you know, we'll start going into, now that you have something in your GUI showing you information, we can actually start showing you where that, inf you know, what kind of information you can get out of this data set. You know, it's still simple, but it's still useful information. So uh, the first thing I'll know is that we have what's called the active filter. So if you have multiple filters, this, this pipeline, the pipeline browser will actually show all those things in there. So if you did a slice after that, it would say cylinder, and then it would show a, a essentially a line to a slice operator and, and, and so forth. Um, but the next thing in the GUI that you'll want to look at is the object inspector. So this is this full, this big full window here. Um, and it has two tabs there. The one is a properties tab and the information tab. The idea of the properties is these are things which you can set to, uh, to essentially get different pieces of information, two different things in pair of you. The information tab um, of the object inspector gives you information about the output of that filter. So in this case, you know, this is, a little, this is not the cylinder output. Um, this is a more complex data set, but the idea is that this gives you an easy way to kind of give you a macro level view of what's going on with your current, you know, with the active filter in your data set. So it'll tell you things like, you know, what data set type is it? Is it an unstructured grid? Is it image data? Um, how many, you know, how big is it? Number of points, number of cells. A lot of times people are just kind of curious as to what's going, you know, what, how big things are. Give you geometric bounds, uh, structured bounds if it's a structured grid, a topologically regular grid. All the arrays that you're using will, all the arrays that are available will be listed there as well. And then it'll also tell you Things like ranges, whether it's a point, whether it's the field is associated with points in the grid or cells in the grid. So, uh, you know, it's very useful. I a lot of times look at this thing just because it's a very easy way to figure out where you're at in your um, analysis and um, give you a very high level view of the infra of the um, of your current data set. So now that you have something in your GUI, you know, we have some, we're operating on something that's a simple cylinder. Well, a lot of times. We want to know more about what's going on, you know, inside of that thing, or we want to know more about what's happening overall with that. So there's these the ideas we want to manipulate the data, and here's where we're talking about filters mostly. Um, we have common filters, calculator. Well, I have density and velocity, and I want to compute momentum. You know, so that calculator filter would be used for that. Uh, glyphs, contour slices. They're in the GUI as quick shortcuts as well as under the filters menu. If you're in the pair view GUI right now, you know, they're listed trying to help you out, showing you uh, they're alphabetically listed and categorized. And finally, uh, and this is a feature I like, is a quick launch. Uh, so if you know which filter you want, so something like gradient of unstructured grid, um, you have the quick launch button. So on um, PC Linux, I have to actually look at this because I'm so used to using it that I don't remember anymore. But I'm, for Linux, it's just control space, and then it'll give up a, it'll bring up a dialog box. You start, start typing information in there, and it'll show you all the filters available, which have, which, you know, which match, which have a regex match with what you're typing in. And it's a quick way to actually select filters in pair of you to do operations on. And finally, there's apply, undo, redo. So apply again. I've set everything up. Now I want you to do the computation I've requested and, you know, because it may take a little bit of time. And then undo, redo, well, maybe I didn't like what I did before. You know, I'll, I'll reset something and we can go back to where I was. And you can do that for both views, meaning that if you accidentally rotated your view a couple of times, you might want to go back to view what you had before, essentially camera angle. So you can reset views, reset parameters on filters, things like that. So pipeline browser, uh, I mentioned this before, and, um, but I'll go into a little bit more detail now. Again, this is the high level view of the analysis and visualization, which you're doing in the pair view GUI. So in this example, we have um, essentially the, on the right is shown a pipeline which you're doing, meaning that, a, so visualization pipeline is uh, essentially a set of operations which you're doing on your data. You can think about disk out ref, which we'll actually um, use a little bit later on. We have this disk out ref uh, file, which we want to read, and it's Exodus file, and we want to do certain things on it. So we'll do something like a slice operation, and we'll do a stream tracer on the operation. Both of these are done directly on the original data set, uh, and that's what's shown with these arrows here, as well as in the pipeline browser, you can see disk out ref being read in, 
then it shows a line to slice here, and then a line to a line to stream tracer there, showing that those are you know those are how things chain together. Meaning that you know in this case, disk out ref, the reader provides the full data set to the slice operator to slice filter, as well as it provides a full data set to the stream tracer filter. And then and then following along with this uh, pipeline browser example. We have, given, given the slice, we want to do a warp by vector filter. So we're going to do the warp by vector filter on the output coming from the slice filter. And similarly, for the stream tracer operator, stream tracer filter, we're going to use the tube filter to essentially expand out the, make the streamlines a little bit longer, or essentially give them a little bit more volume to make it a little bit more visually interesting to see. And some more information on this, again, it's pretty packed. But you can see that uh, there's some, eye, you know, what we call the eyeball. It might not be that easily to see on the screen here, but the idea is that the eyeball is telling you in your current active view whether, whether that output from that object, from that filter, is being shown in that view or not. So in this case, the only two um, filter outputs which are being shown are the warp by vector output and the tube output. And because, it, and finally, the uh, tube output has this kind of blue coloring around it, this blue box, and that's again, that's to actually highlight that this is the active filter. So if you're looking at the pair view GUI and changing properties in the properties panel, the tube filter is the one which would be shown and the one which you'd be doing operations on. If you wanted to, op if you wanted to change one of the other filters properties, for example, the slice, you would click on the slice and then that would show all the properties for slice and you could apply those changes to the slice, oper slice filter. So far, I really haven't shown much inside of the views itself. The idea is that, well, you know, we have a bunch of different views similar to visit and different ways that you can look at your data depending on what you want to do. Uh, you know, and the, and these, these are in the GUI and I'll show that where they are specifically later on, but these are the different um, ways of displaying the data if the eyeball is essentially active in your pipeline browser. And each of these obviously are, you know, show different, way, or different ways of showing your data depending on what you're looking for. Uh, as far as views go, I mentioned that previously. So we have a view is, again, just a visual way of trying to introspect your data. Uh, sometimes it's qualitative, sometimes it's quantitative. So we have things like spreadsheets, we have what we call charts or plots, as well as 2D and 3D views, which you see in the top left. And, in, and similarly, we, similarly, in the way that we have the active filter, we also have what's called an active view when you're dealing with multiple views. And that's indicated by a kind of uh, subtle blue outline along the view that you're looking at. So if you wanted to set view properties, you'd be setting the view properties currently on this 3D view right here with the blue outline. Um, uh, we've had issues where people have actually been colorblind, and so we have ways to change that. So if you're colorblind to blue and won't notice that, you can actually change that in the GUI, because obviously that's something pretty important to look at, um, you know, to understand what's going on. And, you know, it is fairly subtle. And as far as color maps, so again, color maps are a way to, uh, to pseudo color uh, your uh, field variables inside your data set. And the color map editor in Paraview, there's a little um, button on the top left, and I'll show you how to do that. But when you bring that up, uh, this is what's there. And so there's a variety of color maps, lookup tables there as well. Uh, you can do things like uh, presets, heart, basically showing, well, I think there's maybe 30 or 40 in there. Um, by default, we have this uh, blue to red lookup table instead of the uh, rainbow lookup color, which seem, you know, we're trying to avoid the rainbow lookup color, trying to avoid people using that because there are visual artifacts in there, um, the, you know, perception artifacts. And so there is actually still active research on improved lookup tables for perception, again, for uh, people that are, have certain color blindness, you know, color blindness to certain colors. Uh, you want to be able to allow them to see these things, you know, in a way that actually m makes sense to them. Uh, some operations in here, so we can do rescale the data range. That'll do it to the full data range of the active, uh, you know. Um, you can also do a rescale to custom range. So if your data set's from 0 to 100, for, uh, for example, for temperature, you may only want to be, you may want to highlight between 20 and 80. And so that's a way to rescale the custom range to that. Uh, other operations are all there. and um, you can add, it's, um, there's a blog post someplace 
which I didn't read, which I haven't seen in a while, read in a while. But basically, if you want to add in new lookup tables into PairView, it's not all that hard. I think it's either through a JSON or XML file, which you can specify essentially a new co color lookup table and save that inside your um, inside of your PairView GUI. So view properties. I mentioned again. I mentioned uh, filter properties before. View properties. Well, what are these? Uh, Basically, properties associated with the active view, the, that, the view which has that small, subtle blue box around it, blue highlight around it. And so these are things, um, you know, uh, whether the lookup you know, whether the scalar bar is visible or not, uh, uh, things like that, how you want to look at it, whether there's orientation axis shown or not, things like that. And so that's where you'd set options like that. Um, a lot of times, there's a lot of information which you can set for some of these filters and some of these views, and it gets awfully confusing. And you know, one of the, our users that are just starting out with PairView, you know, if you have 40 different options for a filter, it gets awfully confusing, especially when a lot of the defaults are actually fairly good off the top of the, you know, f from the start. So what we have is the idea is that we have um, different ways to actually look through and figure out what what things you can set inside the PairView GUI. And so in this top, in PairView 512, um, it's probably in 431, but I'm not 100% sure about that because um, my memory's not that great. But basically, you have this top um, text widget where you can start typing. In this case, we'll type LEN, and it shows all the properties which we can set, which are available, which have LEN in them, in the description of them. So in this case, we're doing a stream tracer, so there's initial step length, there's length, there's maximum step length, and it's showing all of those. Again, maximum streamline length down here, and it hides the rest. Um, this on the right would be what it would look like without showing that, without typing in LEN there. So you can see there's a whole lot of information in there. And in this case, too, in the, in the right case, you know, on the right image, we have this gear, which is essentially toggles between advanced and, you know, and a regular views. And the idea is that, you know, a lot of times users want to just tweak some, some small thing, you know, for their stuff, but it's generally most people aren't going to do it. So the idea is we'll stick in an advanced option so that most users that don't care about it, you know, won't be even shown and confused by it. But if you want to look at it, you'd click on this little gear to, to essentially expand out the available options for, you know, all different parts of the pair view GUI. So I've shown kind of how you do certain things in PairView, hopefully, but you know, we'll get into that later on as well. But one of the things you often want to do is query your data set. You know, what's, what's my maximum um, temperature value? What's the value at these cells? Things like that. What's my cell ID for this cell? And this is this query data by attributes uh, value. So there's this find data dialog. I think it's also under the edit menu, but you can click on this little widget, the button there. And this, uh, and this, this pop-up window comes up showing you with different ways that you can actually uh, query your data set for certain pieces of information. In this case, we want to find, uh, I don't know if it's clear enough, but maybe for those that have the slides out, you can say, I want to look at EQ, this EQPS uh, field variable, and I want to um, find all these cells where it's greater than 1.5. And so you do that, you set those things in there, it comes out in a spreadsheet view here for some information, as well as, you know, when, once you hit um, a run selection, uh, it will actually show you the selected cells in this case. Uh, the nice thing about PairView is that it has this uh, god-awful pink color, which no one else would ever use for anything, I think. So it's a good way to actually use it as a selection color because it's pretty safe that I don't that no lookup table will probably ever use that color. So it's a good way to highlight certain things in there by being god awful ugly. Um, but uh, you know, we have been, people have mentioned that in the past and it's, I guess, ugly by design, <laughs> noticeable by design. So that's kind of how the um, query data by attributes, if you want to look for certain things in your data sets, how you can do things like that. So beyond that, a lot of times you want to uh, query your data set, you want to do the selections in the GUI as opposed to by numbers. You know, you know where something interesting is happening, but 
you know, you don't have a good expression or a good way of describing it, but you know you can click and drag your mouse certain ways to get that information. And so in the GUI and the top of the window, you'll see these small little um, icons up there for buttons and uh, basically different ways to um, select different cells or points in your data set. So the first one is called the Select Cells On, which is basically get the near cells on the surface. So these only get cells which are on the surface of your current data set. And it'll highlight, you can drag it, uh, you know, for a larger window to get a bigger selection of, object, of cells in that. The similar one for points is the next one down. And oftentimes you want to know stuff through the data set as, as opposed to just on the surface. So you want to know um, cells in a certain uh, vicinity, uh, which may be underneath the surface. So in the next two are um, the operators, you know, essentially the widgets for that, the GUI widgets. So there's the select cells through my selection window, my mouse drag window, um, for both points and cells that's available. Uh, obviously, you know, I, I want to strength that, um, make the point that, um, and I think both Joe and Cyrus did a good job of this already, but, you know, we as scientists should be making visually appealing um, images for both mass, mass consumption, meaning, you know, something which may be shown on CNN versus, uh, as well as something which may be shown in conferences. Please spend the, you know, I can't, I can't uh, emphasize this strong enough that, you know, please spend a little extra time when you're creating your visualizations to make something which is uh, really dynamic, which is very eye-catching, you know, to, because we have to, we, I, you know, I believe, I believe strongly that we have to continuously convince um, the general population that what we do is important, you know, and if we have just very boring images, and uh, you know, and it, it's it, it's tough making the case that you know what we're doing is important, you know, and, and I and I I want to thank both Joe and Cyrus for having very pretty pictures, very beautiful images, visualizations in their slides at this point, just because you know I think it is important, and I would say, you know, making sure that you're presenting information to the public is. A, uh, you know, a, a worthwhile time spent for doing that. And so that being said, how do you get information? How do you get things out of Paraview, right? You have something in the GUI, it's interesting, how do you share it? Uh, the first off is, well, I want the data, so I wanna, you know, I've did, done certain operations, I just slice through it, that's all the information I wanna share. You know, we can do the, in order to output that data set, we can do a file, save data, and it'll give us uh, options of which uh, writer is available to write that information out in. Um, and, that op and that'll operate on the current active filter that you're working on. Uh, images, so how do we save out images? Well, there's actually two ways in Paraview. Uh, the first is just save screenshot. It's a general rasterized image, which is going to come out of it. You can set your um, you can set your image size, do certain things like that. You can set even a a palette there. So you see pair of you with the kind of this battleship gray color in the background. Well, that's nice visually when you're working in a GUI, in my opinion. But when you're presenting, when you're putting um, images in, you know, in publications, a lot of times you either want a full white background or full back. For, or a full black background, depending on what you're trying to do to kind of bring that out, because the gray certainly isn't an, a nice way to do that. And the palette is a way to, and, I, and I'll show you that hopefully if I remember to later on, but the palette is an easy way to say, okay, well, I want to go from a visually, you know, in my monitor, nice view to something which is uh, print worthy. And so beyond that, so beyond rasterized images, we also have export scene. And the idea here is that, well, we, you know, for um, publication quality renderings, images, you know, we want to go to something like LaTeX for, uh, you know, math text. We want to be able to show um, full equations. And so that's a way to actually um, create, um, you know, PDFs and things like, or, you know, postscript files such that it has, you know, so we don't have to worry about rasterization issues. Um, we can store, um, you know, primitives, you know, in a more proper format for publication later on. And finally, movies, um, there's file save animation. I, I'm with Joe on this. I, generally, when I do these types of things, I just create a whole bunch of images outside, you know, through Paraview, and later on, I'll string them together into, into a movie something using like FFmpeg or something like that. That gives you, to me, it just, that's always how I did it, although some people just use the animation uh, option inside of Paraview directly. So, if you're doing, if you're, 
definitely if you're an analyst, uh, the GUI is nice, but eh, the, a lot of times you're going to be doing repetitive operations that you're doing post-processing, right? Well, I want to figure out the lift of a blade, well, I have my, you know, or an uh, aircraft wing, for example. Well, that's a common operation. Your geometry changes slightly, or maybe your, you know, your actual data set may change with the values in there, but the, the full pipeline which you would do in order to get to that point is going to be exactly the same. Um, and the only real difference is going to be what file you're reading in in order to get to that point. And so the idea here is uh, we want to make sure that those tasks are, that you don't have to do 20 full steps every time to get the same value. You know, it's every time and it's going to get awfully boring. And so there's two, there's a couple of solutions for this inside of PairView. The first one is what's called state files, meaning that, okay, I'm in the GUI, I know exactly how everything's set up, I have my full pipeline set up, and now, you know, I want to save this state which I'm in and so that I can actually load, I can come back next, you know, week from now, two weeks from now and actually get to the same spot but maybe with a different file set. So the idea is that with a state file it essentially saves your full pipeline information, all your properties for your filters and when you load it in, um, when you come back two weeks later and you load that state file into Paraview, it'll Load, it'll first query you to say, hey, well, do you have a new data set that you'd like to load instead of my, you know, the original data set you use, which was, has this path. So it'll give you that option, and it'll prompt you, uh, and then it'll come up and take a little bit of processing and output that. It's also a good way to share kind of your uh, visualization state with others that want to get to that same point, too. And so that also helps with a file prompt to get to there for them. And the next step is this Python tracing. Similar to visit, again, you know, a lot of similar functionality. And again, it's just going through the GUI, start trace, essentially telling Paraview, I want to know everything starting from this point on, do a whole bunch of GUI operations, then you do um, uh, stop trace, and then it'll give you options on how you want to, you know, what do you want to do with that trace? Do you want to save it as a file? You can actually save it as a a macro in your GUI window, so there's a little button which will run through those same operations later on again so that you don't have to do them manually, you don't have to run a Python script to get there. So now we'll get to the hands-on practice, um, and I'll switch to Paraview for this. Um, but the slides hopefully are showing, um, it should hopefully follow along with the slides what I'm going to do in the GUI right here. Um, if, you use, if you have Paraview 5.12 installed, it already has a data set uh, installed. It already has a data set as part of that. And on this slide, it shows the full path there. Um, since I'm going away uh, from this slide, hopefully you have the slides so you can follow that. So we'll switch to pair view. So going in through the example here, we'll open out disk out ref. So uh, open. In this case, uh, I have. Uh, I have a quick shortcut where I was before so I know where it is. Click out, click on it, click OK, and this is what it shows up like because I have the auto apply button on right now, but I'll turn that off. Um, so uh, if we were to go through the same operation without the auto apply button, again, you know, it looks slightly different, but it's the same thing that Cyber says, was saying. It won't do anything until um, I tell it to. So it, it's all there. In this case, I want to load all the variables. Well, so we'll click on this little um, button right there for the variables. It'll toggle through partial, all, or none of the to load the variables. In this case, I'm loading all the variables because it's a pretty small data set. Again, I hit apply button, and this is what it looks like. So, you know, it's not very interesting right now. I can rotate around. It looks just like a cylinder for the most part until I rotate it there. And I can see a little indent in there. Um, maybe I want to get an idea of how big the uh, how you know how big the cells are in this data set, so I can switch from a surface representation to a surface with edges representation. So this now gives you an idea of the different um, you know how how big the cells are in this data set. And um, and that option was right there uh, again, where I showed the different views which are available. So outline a very quick, easy way, just showing you the you know, essentially the bounding geometry of it, um, points, different points in it, uh, and you can go through on that on your own. Surface with edges, um, and this is I, I like this view because I want to often see what the data set looks like. And so if I want to actually, in this case, if I want to 
uh, look inside it a little bit more. I can set the opacity on there. I can change that. So I come down in the um, properties panel, the properties tab, uh, scroll down. In this case, I'll just do look for opacity. Type, so type in opacity in the top there and hopefully it comes up. So I'll set the opacity in this case to uh, 0.5. So you can either t use the, this uh, scroll bar or you can just type it in manually. And so the view actually updates automatically in this case. Um, okay, so now we have a data set and we're look we can see a little bit of the geometry in there as well, but we're still not really understanding what's going on here. So the next step is, well, we'll take a slice through the domain, try to help, try to see what's going on interior. So we, we have our disk out ref, which is our reader, which is current active filter. We go to the filters menu up top and we'll do alphabetical and we'll do slice. And it's, and you can see nothing happens right now. Oops, I want to make sure that I get rid of opacity because it's still basically highlighting everything in the properties panel um, uh, based on opacity. So basically nothing is shown at this point and I haven't applied anything. So there's, um, I want to make sure that this is blank in order to get all the options. So in this case, I want to, um, I want to have a normal which is um, in the Z direction. So I could either type it in and here in the normal, if you see that right there. I uh, guess it's a little bit hard to see. I'm not so good at, at the zooming like Cyrus was. But there's another widget button on the bottom, which is just Z normal right there. You click on that, and it'll set it automatically. And then we hit apply, and we'll see uh, one slice through the geometry. And you can see that it's actually there, but it's not colored by anything because we haven't told it yet. The next thing we want to do is actually get a couple more slices through there. So in this case, we will uh, let's see, click on the advanced options, click on that little gear in the upper right corner right here, and then we will see new options, which are basically, uh, we can, this allows us to set offsets for the amount of slices that we want through the domain. So we'll get rid of the current one. And we can, if you click on essentially the little ruler bar, is, and if you hover over, it'll say um, add range of values. I apologize that um, <laughs> the people probably can't follow along in the screen here too much because it's you know a little bit too small. I apologize for that, but hopefully my explanation is decent enough to follow along. But we'll click on that little ruler um, widget button, and up will pop this little window. We'll we'll just click OK here, hit apply. And now we see that we have a bunch of different slice planes in the Z direction, you know, slices through the Z direction in these different offsets. And now, again, it's really still not that interesting. We see the full geometry with some opacity in there, and we see our, you know, are these slices without any transparency in it, but we're not looking at anything interesting yet, still, in my opinion. So now we want to do this pseudo coloring by different variables. We can, so we go to the, um, so this little drop-down menu right here, which basically tells us what do we want to pseudo color from our active filter right now. In this case, we'll choose uh, temperature, TEMP. And so now you see some pseudo coloring of, in this case, just a slice plane. We're not pseudo coloring the outside, um, the, you know, the surface, the full disk out ref uh, data set, just the slices through that. Um, and We'll go, just to get rid of some clutter, we'll get rid of the, uh, the some of these um, lookup table the, in there. We'll just use a solid color for that. Um, but you essentially should get the same result either way. If you want to get rid of this little red rectangle that's around there, that's a widget to just help you kind of visually figure out what's going on with a slice. Uh, there's a button for that. We click on slice and we can do, um, if we look for the uh, show plane, that's all that's showing there. So if we get rid of that, and again, we're back to a nice, something a little bit more informational as far as looking at this stuff. Um, but basically, you know, if, if you want to learn a little bit more, the Pairview tutorial, if you just look that up on Google, uh, it's a really, it's about 100, 
maybe 70 or maybe 70 to 100 pages or so and I'll walk you step by step through each part of Pearview and how to use it properly. What I want to do next is go back to um, essentially talk about using Pearview in, in parallel. Uh, obviously, you know, the whole point of this workshop is to start getting people understanding, you know, issues when you're using these tools in parallel. Everything's nice when you're working on a single process and you have tons of memory enough to do what you want, but, you know, when you're running on some of the big machines at Argon, that's not going to be generally the case. So a lot of times when you're running in parallel, especially post-processing, you know, what do you expect? People, uh, you know, people a lot of times think, well, more processes equals faster. And certainly in, in some certain situations that's going to be true. Other cases that's not going to be true. Uh, depending on the system you're using, what filter you're trying to do, um, really what we're looking for when we're doing pair view and visualization, in my opinion, in parallel, is we're looking for a weak scaling. We have these huge data sets and we need more memory, we need a little bit more processing power to handle those efficiently. You know, it's, we're just not going to be able to load a two terabyte data set onto our laptop or onto our workstation. And so, you know, it's a lot of times what we're looking for is more memory along with a little bit more processing power in order to do that. So, you know, you can't expect if you have uh, a 200, me you know, 200 megabyte data set, something like, you know, thousands or tens of thousands of cells, you're not going to scale to a million MPI ranks on something like uh, Mira because there's just not enough work to do um, compared to the communication. But if you have 100,000 cells or, you know, million cells per um, MPI rank, that should be manageable. So as long as you scale up your data set, the, you know, the pair view should work fairly well as you scale up. So a uh, couple of examples of large data that we've done, and these are still kind of small. The, the asteroid simulation was um, unstructured grid, I believe, and, you know, probably five years old, if not 10 years old. Something recently, and this is actually from a, a strong scaling study, so the uh, number of unstructured cells isn't really all that impressive overall, but the number, the M number of MPI ranks which we ran on was, you know, we, we hit, um, uh, I believe it was about a third or maybe two thirds, I don't, yeah, I think 32,000 nodes of Mira and, uh, with some of our in-situ tools running and outputting through Catalyst, which is Paraview's in-situ tool. So we've shown that, you know, certainly some things work very efficiently. Uh, you know, at that scale. So similar to, um, similar to visit, you have the idea of client server and um, the idea is that, well, the data server, you can break it up into even finer levels, and this is more for historical reasons. Um, back when you had real, a lot of visualization clusters at supercomputing centers, the idea was that you'd have your main processing done on a machine like Mira, but it didn't have GPU features, you know, there's no GPU cards in there. So maybe you want to use something like Cooley to do the rendering, so you'd have a whole bunch of um, compute nodes, essentially the data server running on Mira, then you'd be running um, some of the, you'd connect to Mira to uh, something like Cooley, which has a whole lot of visualization capabilities for doing things like rendering, and then you'd have your client, you're either a Python interface to it or the pair of you GUI that you'd connect to and doing things again like depth compositing, a whole bunch of things like that. As far as pair of you uh, running modes, this is kind of again the highlight view, but most people really just use um, the, the top three. The idea is the top one is just using pair of you on your laptop without running any separate process. This is that built-in server which I mentioned near the beginning. Next one is the combined server where you're doing the data server, you know, all the data computations as well as the rendering on the same compute machine. Um, and then finally you have your client, uh, either Python or, GUI, or the pair of you GUI to uh, inform the server what operations to do. Batch is basically PV batch, so a Python script which you've generated in pair of you trace, running it in batch in multiple and parallel processes to do that. And finally that split, split server which we still keep around and but I don't know if people really use that form anymore. So connecting to a server, uh, I can show you this later on as well, but basically the directions are here for connecting to Cooley. Um, as I mentioned before, um, I'd recommend Paraview 431 for if you're doing production level work, uh, big data sets, um, things like that. I think 512, which is a current version of Paraview, it's working. It's not working as well as we'd like at this point um, since 
we just tried installing ParaView PV Server 5.1.2 on um, Cooley last week, so we still need to work out a couple of things. You can still do the connection there, but um, you might not. You might have a little bit of a rendering issues from what we've been um, playing around with. Um, but directions for um, connecting to a server are listed online and um, and uh, has some directions there. Uh, connecting to a server again. This is similar to data trying to get your data into Pairview. If you can't connect easily to a Pairview server running on some remote machine like Cooley, uh, Mira, whatever, you're not going to use Pairview. So we want to make sure, in the same way that you can load files easily into Pairview, you can connect to remote, powerful um, compute machines with Pairview. And so the idea is again, you can download uh, connection inf information on how to do that, and it's fairly automated to do that. And I can show people um, if they want to. But a um, uh, couple of things for people that are uh, using, you know, that want to try this out. Uh, for Mac, you need um, XQuartz, which is just an X11, um, uh, X11 library stuff um, that recently, I believe, got removed from the Mac um, distribution from the Mac OS. For Windows, you need PuTTY, which is just SSH access. Um, and then once you essentially you select which way you want to connect, um, either Okuli for both Linux and Mac or the Windows to Cooley for uh, obviously for Windows machines. So select which you, one you want, click connect, and you'll be shown this dialog right here. And this is going to prompt you for a bunch of things. Uh, the main things to keep in mind are make sure that it knows the full path to um, the X term. Uh, this is for Linux or Windows. There's no X term for um, Windows, and that's kind of why we have two separate um, files for that. Um, the SSH executable, um, it should be set automatically with the, uh, you know, to pretty good values for the, uh, for the files which you fetch, but you may need to tweak them slightly. Finally, um, your username, obviously, we can't, <laughs> we don't know the user, so you'll need to fill that in. I'm using 512, but put in V431 if you want the, if you want to try it, something which has been tested much more rigorously. Finally, um, account project, if you're doing it for, you know, this workshop, for this, uh, session you you know at, at past 2016 is the account which you have and I think that's going to be available for another week or so about a week or maybe two um, and that'll work and you can set your default you can set number of nodes to use things like that how long you want it to run for and that'll set up it'll run it it'll launch the job remotely it'll do the connection and then you'll just um, start working on pair view so when you go to parallel, you know, and you're dealing with large data sets, interactivity becomes an issue, especially when you're manipulating your views. So you can go to the out, you know, one suggestion I do and give is often going to the outline view. Well, you get a box, you know the geometry, and you can easily manipulate that without doing significant amount of, um, amount of processing on the compute server or communication. But other ways, what you can do if you want to see the geometry is you can set the um, level of detail of what's being shown interactively. So basically, it'll take um, a mildly complex, in this case, data set, and it'll, it'll essentially decimate it, return, you know, become, make it into a more coarse mesh such that it's easier to render and compute on the server. And, you know, it doesn't look quite as good, but for interactivity to kind of get camera angles and things like that set, it's awfully nice. Other options are um, image based, so you can just do, um, instead of decimating the geometry, you can just essentially combine pixels to have a more coarse view of it while you're interacting in it. And once you stop interacting with the GUI, it'll go back to your fine representation. And the default values for these things are set pretty nicely, but you can tweak them. And you know, if you're having uh, interactivity issues in parallel, uh, pr you know, pl please bring that up on the mailing list, and we'll probably come up with good uh, suggestions on that. So some current directions. Uh, Catalyst is an in-situ pair of you, which I showed an image from before. You know, we're going to, um, one of my pushes on that is that, you know, I think that in-situ tools need to prove, need to show that they can go to high levels of parallelism. Uh, you know, it's, and, you know, and we've shown that with Catalyst. Um, we also do web mobile, so there's Pairview web. You can have a, you know, web access uh, to, um, to Pairview server. 
uh, OpenGL rendering, so that's been recently changed. So we now are, you know, the nice thing with the update that with VTK being so old was that we've gotten both faster and memory efficient. So that's, as a Paraview 512, that's much better than you would have seen in previous um, versions of Paraview. Ray tracing, so we're using Osprey and maybe some, uh, some other tools to basically, again, get quality image renderings out, out of Paraview. Uh, things like shadows, occlusions, stuff like that. Um, and uh, obviously, we need to take care of the um, parallel, you know, the parallel available computing infrastructure. So the Xeon Phi's, Tesla cards, things like that. So we have SMP. So again, VTKM, and then there's uh, VTK SMP tools, which is actually part of VTK itself, as opposed to VTKM being something separate. But they're both designed to use um, these different levels of parallelism, you know, fine-grained parallelism, essentially efficiently on these machines. And with that, I'll end, and I want to thank everyone for attending, and I'll open it up for questions. So uh, how do you uh, visualize higher order methods in Paraview? So the VTK only provides uh, a visualization up till uh, second order polynomial. So how, if you want to visualize like a spectral methods or higher order uh, interpolation methods, how do you do that? So recently, um, in VTK, um, we've extended it out to, um, I think, maybe cubic to all of the, or to a certain amount of cubic cells, so triangle, um, quad, uh, tet, hex, um, pyramid, and we are working on a higher order, you know, on a general higher order way to represent higher order cells for that, but, um, you know, that is work in progress. Um, <clears throat> for the um, uh, f for using the batch version of Paraview, do I have to have a full OpenGL stack uh, running? So, especially, can I run this fully uh, on a non-display uh, system? So, there are, you can use OS Mesa to um, you know for uh, machines that don't have. Um, you know, graphics cards, OS Mesa is essentially off screen. Um, so I'll answer this in two ways, and maybe neither of them are what you want. Uh, but um, so the first way is that if you're using, um, and if you actually have NVIDIA, there's the, um, but you, you know, like the Tesla cards, but you don't have X11. There's EG, you know, NVIDIA has EGL with their latest um, NVIDIA cards the Tesla cards, which you can use for off-screen rendering, essentially, you know, rendering without X11 context. Um, and uh, uh, Intel has something appropriate, you know, something similar as well for the Xeon Phi. I, you know, I don't remember what it is off the top of my head. Cyrus probably knows. Um, Joe may know. Joe probably knows also. Um, but beyond that, um, what you could do is use one of the Catalyst editions, which will the idea of the Catalyst editions is that, well, there's a whole lot of Paraview and you don't want to link to all of that Paraview when you're running an in situ simulation because you may have an, you may increase your executable size by 200 to 300 megabytes. And, you know, when you multiply that by a million MPI ranks or 100,000 MPI ranks, that's a boatload of memory, even though it doesn't sound that much individually, that grows up and that, you know, that's stealing from your simulation code. And so these Catalyst editions, we have versions which don't have any rendering in them, but they have Python support. So you could theoretically build a Catalyst edition with Python wrap stuff and use a PV batch from that to do, to do essentially data processing without any um, rendering components in it. 